Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. <laughs> well, my sister's been at it again. She says, what about a q and A? I mean, I got a lot of questions you're not answering. And of course, it's right before the holiday season, so. Janet, this is for you. Okay, bunch of questions. This is, this is, this is a good one. By, this summer, by strange coincidence, my 80-year-old sister and I both had shingles. And my sister, who lives in Canada, was unaware of vaccines. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> it's like Florida. Uh, anyway, I've been vaccinated, and I had a painless outbreak. She had a lot of problems, disfiguring, a lot of pain. Uh, and then she said, I recently had lunch with a well-respected oncologist who himself had a, a malignancy and remission. He'd had every COVID vaccine, but said he was unaware of any other vaccines. <laughs> What's with these people? <laughs> All right, so it is true that the vaccine recommendations have changed a lot, and so it's, it's important to, that you communicate with your primary care physician to make sure. But right now, the CDC recommends that people over the age of 65 should get the COVID vaccines, of course, the most recent COVID vaccine, should get your flu shot, because the, there's a high risk of complication with pneumonia from flu, you should have a, your pneumococcal vaccine. Over the age of 50, actually, you should get your shingles vaccine, is Oster, but over the age of 65 for sure. Then uh, either Tdap or Td, so either tetanus, diphtheria, and whooping cough, or tetanus and diphtheria should, have, should get. And of course, the newest respiratory syncytial virus for adults over the age of 60. So there are a lot of great these are great things because they are. These are the problems that uh, older pa patients have. So, a lot of vaccines available, and there may be others in addition uh, based on travel and exposure. And so, you should talk to your primary care physician. And if you're traveling to other parts of the world, you should uh, talk about check with the travel clinic. Now, this was an interesting one. In retrospect, many people were questioning the use of masks during the pandemic. Was it ever scientifically proven that masks actually help prevent serious COVID disease? So there were actually, you know, the, the, the concern was that prior to the pandemic, there really weren't any robust uh, clinical trials. And so during the pandemic, there were two randomized clinical trials that were done. The first one was in Denmark, 3,000 patients who received surgical masks and a recommendation to use them uh, not only at home, but also uh, when they're outside of home. And that, that one was considered inconclusive. And the, here's the reason why. The incidence of infection was actually 20% lower in the group wearing masks. So, but the sample size was too small to make it reach statistical significance. So, uh, and the other thing is if the, you looked at the groups that were supposed to be wearing masks, only 46% actually did it. So that one was not conclusive, but highly suggestive that it would work. But there was a second, much larger study in Bangladesh. 600 villages with more than 340,000 residents were randomized to receive either a cloth or surgical mask and compared to a group that didn't have masks at all. And so mask use was uh, three times more common in the interventional, the ones, ask, the ones that are supposed to wear masks, than in the non-interventional uh, in ones. And the intervention wearing masks reduced the incidence of symptomatic infection by 9.5% overall and 35% uh, lower in those age 60 years or older because they were more likely to wear their masks. So that was a very highly positive uh, outcome. So masks do work. And surgical masks work better than cloth masks. You know, it's not fun, but they, there are, they were effective. How long are taste and smell affected by long COVID? So this is sort of good news story. The main thing is that over a period of up to three years, you get improvement. Usually the taste of, uh, the, the sense of taste comes back faster than the sense of smell. Uh, and remember the olfactory uh, receptors, the olfactory receptors in your brain and nose uh, have the receptor for the virus. And that's been shown that the, they actually get infected. So it takes two to three years, but uh, it does seem to come back. Uh, is there any data how many people actually would have died if the vaccines weren't mandated? And this is an editorial. It's, it's frustrating to hear politicians who badmouth mandated vaccines with no regard to the number of people who were saved by the vaccine. <laughs> what an excellent point. So there, there have been a bunch of studies, epidemiologic studies, to try to answer that question. So 
there was a, a study that was uh, published in common, by the Commonwealth Fund that said the country's vaccination program pre prevented about 18 million hospitalizations and more than 3 million deaths. There was another paper that, was, that came out of uh, the NIH that said uh, they found at least 232,000 deaths could have been prevented had the patients been vaccinated with at least a primary series in 2022. Uh, and then this is kind of, you know, epidemiologists and economists look at the cost of saving lives. So it was, if you look at from 21 in, in the, during the period when the pandemic started to the end of 21, uh, there was a 14% increase in the vaccination rate. Uh, and what happened was, uh, if you look at it, it took an average of 124 vaccinations to save one life. And the full cost of, of two doses was $222, which implies that the, the country paid sort of, it cost $55,000 to save every life. <laughs> well worth it. So anyway, a bunch of studies that showed that, you know, vaccination was very effective. And, you know, we talked about Florida when they were doing vaccines, the, the death rate in Florida was lower than any other state. And as soon as when they stopped mandating vaccines, it recommended that people not get vaccines, mortality rate went higher than all the other states. So, you know, vaccines work. Uh, does COVID uh, impact cognitive function? So there are a bunch of studies that have shown that one of the complications with long COVID is that cognitive function is worse. Uh, it's usually um, uh, in, in uh, memory, short-term memory, and it was usually associated, actually there's a big study in the UK that showed that cognitive decline was also associated with a reduced when people stopped exercising <laughs> and increased alcohol use. Uh -oh. <laughs> what did I do <laughs> during COVID? I stopped exercising and drank a lot of alcohol. Anyway, that's another. Okay, does COVID infection uh, during pregnancy increase the risk of preterm birth? We've gone over this many weeks. The answer is absolutely yes. And not only does it increase the risk, if you get vaccinated during pregnancy, it reduces the risk. Get vaccinated. Uh, how did the pandemic impact preschool children? This is really interesting. This was a a study, I, it wasn't obvious to me, it, it was a little bit surprising to me. This is an Ontario, Ontario birth study, looked at, uh, at uh, several thousand uh, kids. And what they found was that, <laughs> surprisingly enough, uh, in the first couple of years, children actually did better because they thought they were getting more individual uh, exposure, but they did less well in social, uh, in social behavior. So it's kind of, I mean, I'm not sure that I'm, that's typical in the United States. In the United States, it looked like a lot of preschool kids were impaired uh, both in their quantitative skills as well as their social skills. But in this one from Canada, it was the quantitative skills were okay, but the social skills were not, not good. Okay. Is it true there was a COVID virus that killed cats? This, I think Lily probably asked this question. <laughs> So th this is fascinating. Uh, on the island of Cyprus um, in the Mediterranean, it's also called the island of cats because they have one million uh, feline population. Uh, there was a big a bunch of cats started dying and they were trying to figure out what it was. Originally it was thought to be a feline leukemia virus, but they found it, a, they called it a feline COVID-23. This is great. It contains a large chunk of RNA from a dog virus, the canine coronavirus. So I think it was that dogs were trying to do this <laughs> to the cats. But it turns out it was really a coronavirus and actually the antivirals for human coronavirus were effective in treating the cats, uh, but it was a coronavirus. It, and that does not affect humans. So no worry about those people in Cyprus. Okay, uh, is there a combined flu vaccine with COVID vaccine coming in the near future? Yes, there's a bunch of studies looking at, in Pfizer, looking at their co combined COVID and flu, and so far the data looks very promising. Uh, what influenza is circulating currently? H1N1, we talked about it, influenza A is the, is the predominant one. Are there differences? I was asked, differences between A and B? A generally is a little bit worse, but the flu is the flu. Uh, what's the outlook globally? Uh, that's a pretty good uh, big flu season. <laughs> they're, they're around a billion cases annually, and it's looking like it'll be just a typical, I think, 
annual flu season this year with a lot of, lot of infections. Usually there's somewhere around 300,000 to 400,000 deaths globally. And that's sort of the way it works in flu. I think it's, I think it's not going to be worse, but it's probably the same. Okay, how concerned would you be about socializing during the holiday season? Really good question. If it's your family members, you know, ask people if they're sick. If they're, if they're, if they're symptomatic, they should not participate. As you know, we've been talking about it for the last couple of months. Flu is prevalent, RSV is around, and coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 is increasing. So, you know, if they're, if they're symptomatic, they should check to see if they have SARS. I mean, if you have the kits. Uh, or stay home and or wear a mask around people. Uh, but if that's, a, you know, if, if that's, if you know people and no one's symptomatic, I think it's worth asking, though. I should ask people who are coming over. If you have respiratory symptoms, you know, probably shouldn't come over. Uh, even though you're fully vaccinated, do you sometimes decide to wear a mask? Well, uh, you remember the vaccines don't necessarily prevent infection, particularly the COVID infection. Uh, it does, re it reduces your severity of illness. So if you don't want to be infected and you're traveling in dense population, you know, in the airports and stuff like that, I, if, you, if you're worried about it, wear a mask. I see a lot of people actually are wearing masks in airports. Once you're on the plane and you're sitting down and the ventilation is on, you're fine. There's been, you know, it's, it, there's high, a high degree of ventilation in the airplane. Do you think wastewater will continue to be an important way to predict illness? Yes. <laughs> One of the, that illness so much predict prevalence of the disease and like and case number. I guess that's illness. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the one thing that came out of the pandemic was wastewater is very, very useful. Probably the best way to predict uh, how much virus is around. Uh, it seems like many people were vaccinated in the first rounds of COVID vaccine are passing on the new vaccine. Why do you think that is? <laughs> stupid. Let me be very clear about it. It's stupid. The newest vaccine is, is the XBB. It, it's nothing like, I mean, it's very different from the original vaccine. With this JN1 circulating, I would be very, I would really get your updated vaccine. You, you are likely to get COVID again if you, if you haven't. All right. I want to end today with a few shout outs. Of course, uh, Christmas is coming up as is Kwanzaa. Uh, I want everyone to have uh, a wonderful time. If you're taking time off, which you deserve with friends and family, you know, relax, enjoy your time. It's been another <laughs> interesting year, a lot of disease out there. Uh, but, you know, for those of you who are here taking care of patients and make, taking care of the labs, I really applaud your efforts. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, your dedication is, you should know it's really appreciated. Uh, we, our institution never really takes a day off, and so everybody in the Baylor community is working hard for the, for the patients and for our, our learners and for the community. So I want to thank everybody and hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas in Kwanzaa. Can't wait to see you next week. President's office. It's Santa calling for Lily. Please hold. Lily, Santa is on line one. Hey Lily, we're having some supply chain problems here at the North Pole. Can you give us a hand on the East Coast run? Ho, ho, ho! Excellent! Oh yeah, one more thing. I can't send Team Rudolph and Blitzen. I have to send you their cousins, Randolph and Oscar.